Hello world, and we are back, and this is going to be episode 8 of the poker vlog. My name's Kyle Fischel, and this week the theme that I'm going to try to stick to is balance. And balance is important in poker, and it's important in poker for several reasons. One, when you play poker, you play it a lot, it can really sometimes seem like it's the only thing that matters. It can really dominate your world. All you think about is poker and when you're going to play and when the next table's at. And that's that's when, you know, a, a losing session can really put you on tilt. But you really want to have a balanced lifestyle. You want to, you know, eat right. You want to build relationships with your family, friends, you know, maybe a significant other. Exercise. When we talk about balance, we also want to talk about within poker. We want to talk about like balancing the amount of time you play and the amount of time you study to get better. Like for me, what I do is I watch a lot of poker stuff on YouTube. I watch many other vloggers that do content, explain their thought processes, how they would have played certain hands. And that's been tremendously helpful for me. Also, just basically any tournament on TV the announcers that that um, talk during hands are very knowledgeable they they're very good like, like if you just watch an episode you can learn so much through just one episode of announcers telling you what this person has about ranges about what should happen about people doing something you know tricky and maybe why and maybe like their opinion of it that's a really good way to to learn hundreds of articles on the internet to just help your game like all over there you can search whatever you want like flush draw strategies straight draw strategies you know playing against aggressive people managing tilt like mental game of poker there's hundreds of articles online that if you just search for it you can get a lot of knowledge very quickly and you know, you have to balance that with the time you play. So you can't just always play. You can't just always study. You know, you study, you learn something, you try it out in the game. Because poker is constantly evolving, I recommend anyone trying to get better when they're doing research, um, read more contemporary articles because even things one and two years ago could be considered old or out of practice or not really the best, you know, theory to how to play certain hands. So you really have to stay current when you're playing poker and really, you know, stay active with with what's the proper strategy because, you know, five years ago, if you flopped top pair, you had to bet three quarters pot or better. Like that was just standard. Now, you know, people flop top pair and they're willing to bet one third pot or even check sometimes. And these are like top pros playing like $100,000 tournaments. So... You know, the theory and the strategies change consistently and understanding what each action means and what your opponent thinks it means can give you a tremendous edge when you play. Now time for some poker hands. Uh, so this weekend I only played one day. Um, and I played for about four hours and I thought balance would be a good theme to this episode because I showed how you should balance your value hands with your bluffs in a poker game. Now I'll explain how, why that happened. So, for the first hand that I'm going to talk about, I am on the button and I have pocket kings. And an early position player raises to 20. There are two callers and it comes to me. <clears throat> now, obviously, when you have kings and you know there's already a decent amount of money in the pot, you want to raise relatively big. You really don't want to see kings four ways. So I pump it up to $120, <clears throat> which is definitely a sizable bet. And I want it to be this big because I really don't want more than one person to, to come along ever. Like if, it, if I see the flop three ways, I'm not going to be happy. I want to completely price out all suited connectors and basically weak aces like ace five suited i want all of that nonsense out of there so that's why i size pretty big and it folds around and we win yeah i gotta preface this by saying when everyone folded i showed the kings now the theme is balanced because 
if we only three bet with with big hands, then this strategy can be exploited. Like every time I played kings or every time I played aces and I raised big, everyone would fold, and in the long run I would lose money because they always fold when I have a big hand and they always call when I have a weak hand. So we want to balance our, our, our hands that are good with some hands that are not so good. So for the second hand I'm going to talk about, it was the exact same pre-flop situation. Um, it was one person raised to 20 and there was two callers. In this hand, I looked down at king-queen suited. So that's not really a bad hand, but it's definitely not as premium as kings are. But either way, I want to balance my king's range with my hands that aren't so good. So I raise it to 120 again because I honestly hope that um, everyone folds again. Now everyone at the table thinks that I only play premium hands when I, when I raise big in late position you know, to 120. And we balanced it by throwing in a not so great hand and playing it the exact same way we'd play kings. So we really keep our opponents guessing, and so this hand has the exact same result. I get, I fold it around, I win that hand too. And that's what we want. We want to win when we have it, we want to win when we don't have it. Like, so this time I do not show my cards, because I did not have it, but, you know, showing earlier kind of gave me the credibility to, to pull the play off with a hand that's all right, because... In this scenario, if someone calls, I'm still happy to see a flop with king-queen suited. Like, it's not a bad hand. But I'd much rather just have a fold, you know, win 60 bucks, because that's a decent chunk of change. So, that hand worked out too. That I'm going to talk about, it's the other way, where I have it, and things work out well for me. Early position player makes it to 20, and it folds to me on the button with pocket queens. Here, I definitely want a 3-bet, just because I have queens. And I've now that I've told you these three these hands, I've three bet, you know, more than anyone else at the table by far, like four or five times. Like my three betting is is decent amount of time that now that I have it again, I'm more likely to get called because they're less likely to believe that I'd have a good hand every time because I have it, because I've balanced my range. But now I do have it, so we're good. Uh, so one player calls and I'm happy about that. I three bet the queens to 80, and he calls. Uh, really, the as long as there's no ace on the flop, I'm super happy to just continue betting and you know get one or two value bets in there. See an ace, I don't want to see a king. I'm fine with because there's it's unlikely for him to have as many kings as aces in his range because his range is ace king, ace queen, ace jack, maybe ace ten suited. A lot of that. Okay, so there's much less kings in his range. So if a king comes, I'm not too worried about it. Because the only real king in his range is ace king, pocket kings, which he really can't have pocket kings because he should re-raise me with pocket kings. But, you know, it's a cash game, it's 2-5, anything's possible. So there's not too many kings in this guy's range. He really shouldn't be uh, raising from early position, then calling a, a large 3-bet with king jack or king 10 suited. I mean, king queen's possible, but because I have pocket queens, I block it, so it's pretty unlikely. So I really just don't want to see an ace. And the flop comes in the window. An ace. Ugh, right in the window too. Damn. But right under it's a queen. Then a jack. So the flop did get better after that window card. Anyway. So he checks to me. And because I had talked about all those aces there in his range, ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack, ace-ten, all of those, like, I should be able to get at least one or two streets of value. I'm very happy with that flop now that there's a queen on it. So, he checks to me, I bet 100, I get a call. And for a turn card, I'm really just hoping that it's unconnected, because the board's good enough to get a decent number of streets of value, but, like, if a king comes or a ten comes, he could easily have ace, king, ace, ten, and just, you know, top pair plus straight draw would definitely call. So, I'm really just looking for uncoordinated cards. And the turn is a seven of hearts, so definitely not a bad card. Don't even, don't even 
think about that. So he checks to me again. I bet $175 because I think that any ace is still going to call here and any two pair is going to call and pretty much most pairs plus straight draw is going to call. So I think that's a, a good card to, to just bet kind of small to get a call from the entire range of hands he has. And it works out. He does call. And the river is a two of hearts. It does bring a backdoor flush draw. So I'm really unconcerned with that because uh, the ace of hearts is there. And I have the queen of hearts. So like the only hand that I would see having a flush draw here would be like king queen of hearts. But I blocked the queen of hearts. So unlikely that hearts did anything. So I'm really not worried about it. So when he checks to me, I... I decide to bet 250 and he literally looks at his cards. He's like, oh, this is going to be a massive cooler. I'm just like, for me or for you, bro? See, I never considered him to have aces until this point because, you know, I've played for a long time and at a 2-5 table, I don't think I've ever seen someone just flat uh, aces when they're 3-bet to them. When he makes it 20 and I make it 80, I've seen people do 140, the min 3-bet. I've seen people jam all in for $2,000 when it's only bet 80. It's kind of overvaluing, but it works out sometimes. But I've never really seen someone with aces just call there when they were 3-bet, ever. Just ever. Could you actually have aces here? Like, that would be nasty. But he eventually does call and he shows pocket jacks. So, it was a, a cooler situation, set over set. Should not happen too often. But I really don't think that this guy needed to call three streets of value. Now, I talk about how to get better. Another good way is to always review the hands that you played and also review it from both people's perspectives and both sides. And I told the guy, like, in my mind, how you lose less money when it's when it's jacks there is, like, I 3-bet to 80, you call, it comes ace-queen-jack on the flop, and you have jacks, and the guy bets $100 into you. Right now, you need to raise to 250 300 If you raise to 250 300 on the flop, like, queens and aces are probably going to 4-bet. And at that point, you should pretty easily just fold. And if they just call, then there's two ways it's going to go from there. It's either going to go checked. It's either going to get checked down or the jacks are going to check. And then the queens are going to bet, like, 500 and then the jack should then, again, pretty easily fold. Because bet on the turn, there's literally not a single hand they could have that jacks are beating. The only hand that might do that is ace-king. And that's a might. I don't think ace-king can, can even bet a turn if jacks raised uh, on the flop. Because all the hands that beat jacks would continue when jacks raise on the flop, and pretty much every hand that it's losing to, like ace king should probably uh, fold there, pocket 10 should probably fold there, queen jack. So basically that hand could go be a lot cheaper for the jacks. He doesn't have to pay 100, pay 175, pay 250. If he just makes it 250 on the flop, he, he should be able to fold um, against any further aggression. Because all the hands that are better than him are going to continue. All the hands that are worse than him are gonna fold. Balancing your range can get you paid off here. Because of the amount of times that I did three bet, I don't have to have a great hand here. And if the opponent chooses to show some aggression to try to figure that out, he might save himself money in the long run. And reviewing your hands, like after they happen, is how you're gonna get better and save yourself money. So if there was a way to to reduce the, the cost of a cooler, then you'll find it and you'll know how to, how to you know, take advantage of that for next time. You know, that was a big hand that went my way. And so for the first weekend in November, we made $1,166. So uh, November is starting off good. 
you know, everything is definitely working out so far. And we'll see what happens in the future. <laughs>